Okay. <laughs> so here, in part three, I like to look at the, what the rabbis have to say, just you know, to have a glance at the rabbinic literature in these verses, because um, it, it can give us additional insights to talk about. We can look at the New Testament parallels. Also, we like to look at the Aramaic Targum a little closer in because it is a rabbinic translation of the of the book of Isaiah. And so, again, it becomes a valuable resource for our continued study of the book of Isaiah. So let's look at the Targum Jonathan and see what Jonathan has to say here. And uh, so here's the Targum Jonathan. Okay, so let's read through that. It says, Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time... And have declared it, yea also are my ye also are my witnesses that there is no God besides me, and there is none strong, except he to whom strength is given from me. They that make images are all of them vanity and worship that does not profit them them, excuse me. And they are witnesses against themselves, that they do not see nor uh, know that they may be ashamed. Whoever maketh a god or a molten image, it is for no purpose. Behold, all their worshippers shall be ashamed, and the working artificers are workmen of the sons of men. Let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. They shall fear and be confounded together. The smith maketh an axe out of iron, and bloweth the coals in the fire, and maketh it firm with the hammer, and worketh it with the power of his strength. But when he that worketh it is hungry, and does not eat bread, he hath no strength. And if he is thirsty and drinks no water, he faints. The carpenter stretches out the line. He applies a plum, uh, plummet to it. He carves it with knife. And he doth taileth it together. A dovetail. Okay, dovetail. <laughs> dovetail. Um, together. And he makes it after the likeness of a man according to the beauty of a woman, that it may remain in the house. He has shown for himself cedars. So hewn, heweth for himself cedars and taken the scarlet oak and the chestnut, and the seasons them. He plants the ash among the trees of the forest, and the rain nourishes it. Okay, so again, you know, what we see here is the reverse order for um, these things. You know, that the first thing a man does is hew down the wood, then he makes the idol. But here we see making the idol, and then he hews down the wood. So you get this reversal of, of um, the process or the procedure. And so Isaiah is showing the futility of idol worship, right? I mean, and idol, manu idol manufacturing. So um, let's look at verse 8 a little closer here. Um, we see here uh, from the Hebrew scriptures on the left here, and then two versions of the Targum Jonathan. This is um, Lagos. And this is uh, Sepharia, the website. So Isaiah says, he says, Fear not, neither be afraid, have I told thee from that time, and declared it. Ye also are my witnesses, that there is no God besides me, and there is none strong except he whose strength is given from me. Okay, so the Targum, Jonathan on verse 8, an Aramaic translation and paraphrase the Hebrew Bible, and it sometimes adds words and phrases to clarify the meaning or to harmonize with other biblical passages in the Tanakh. Okay, that's what the rabbis do. And so the Targum differs from the Hebrew Bible in several ways here. And so we, we see the Targum uses the word, um, this word here. Uh, let me see. It's always hard. I should highlight this before I come in and do this, because <laughs> um, it's hard to find what uh, what it is. Is that um, so? We see we see this word um, "dame," and um, and so we're looking at this. That means before me, instead of the word um, "beside me." And um, to emphasize God's external existence and sovereignty all the, all, over all the other gods. And we also see this phrase, um, uh, let's see here, it is, this phrase is set to whom strength is given from me. And just trying to see, Demi. 
Um, yeah, right here. Um, it's right here at the end. Okay. And, um, oh, okay. So right, man, it's just like, I just can't see. Okay. Um, I can't find these words. Okay. So the first phrase we're looking at was right here. Okay. And, um, and right here. Okay. And then the second phrase is we're looking at is right here. Okay. That, that we're talking about additions to the, uh, the translation in relation to the Aramaic Targum versus the, the Hebrew Bible. And so, uh, it, it says that, and there is none strong, okay, to stress God's comparable power and might over the idols of the nations. And, and the, then the Targum adds this phrase, except he to whom strength is given from me. And that implies that any strength or authority that humans or angels have is derived from God and dependent on his will. Okay, so this is this is opposed to the phrase that um, there is no God, I know not any, that uh, we see we see right here, okay? There is no God, um, I know not any, or there is no rock, right? Um, there is no God, Tour. And so this implies that the Targum is making this, this uh, statement of faith that strength and authority comes from God, whereas the Masoretic Text is stating the challenge that there are no other gods besides the God of Israel. And um, something to note is that with these studies, I'm usually two weeks ahead so I've, I'm working on the study right now, two weeks ahead. So then I got to come back and try and remember what I wrote. I usually read through this, and but um, I didn't didn't take the time because it takes a long time to go through this again. And just before the study, that I I go through it again, right? And so um, it it just is a matter of of trying to remember. And um, I always I do things ahead of time so that if something were to happen, that I could always be on schedule. Okay, but anyway, um, and that that's why it is. Sometimes it's like I'm trying to remember, <laughs> trying to remember, you know. Um, okay, so uh, these these differences in the translation may affect our interpretation and application of this verse in our lives in the following ways. And uh, so let me, okay, and. Uh, the Targum reminds us that God is the source and the origin of everything and that nothing can exist or act independent of him. You know, therefore, we should acknowledge him as the creator. You know, I mean, for example, you know, God gives us free will to do whatever we want. You know, there may be people who don't believe in God and do whatever they want. But you note that God gives us the gift of life, breath, the gift of just breath, of breathing, being able to live. You know, so when I say that, nothing exists or acts independently of him it's from that sense you know that that god has created us you know and that everything is working because of what he has done and what he sustains you know and so there's a blessing that he gives to both the righteous and the unrighteous in just the gift of life right and so um the the scriptures these scriptures the targum is reminding us of these things that um, nothing exists independent of him. Therefore, we should acknowledge him as our, as our creator and sustainer of all things and trust in his providence and wisdom, regardless of our situation. You know, the Targum warns us that the God of Israel is the only true and living God and that all of the gods are false and powerful, powerless. Therefore, we are to worship him alone, the Lord God Almighty alone, and not be deceived by the idols of this world, which can neither help nor harm us. The Targum Jonathan further teaches us that the Lord God is the giver and the taker of strength and that he can empower or he can weaken anyone according to his purpose. Yes, therefore, we should humble ourselves before him and not rely on our own strength or abilities, but on his grace and his mercy. And you know, this is why the scriptures speak the way they do concerning the Lord God Almighty. You know, so the, the, this verse is used um, in the New Testament in several places, actually. You know, there is a it's quoted or alluded to by Yeshua and his disciples. You know, some of the parallels are found in Revelation 1, verses 17 to 18, where Yeshua identifies himself as the first and the last, the living one who's able, who is dead and is alive forevermore, echoing these words from Isaiah 44 and, and even in verse 6, where uh, and then in, in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 through 6, Paul affirms that there is no God but one, 
and that for believers there is only one God, the Father, and one Lord, Yeshua the Messiah, you know, which reflects the monotheistic message of Isaiah 44, verse 8, and, um, and so forth. Now in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Yeshua promises his disciples that they will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and that they will be his witnesses to the ends of the earth, fulfilling the role of Israel and in Isaiah 44, verse 8, according to the Targum translation. Now, Rashi, he has the following to say concerning these things. So let's look at Rashi for a second here. And he says, And be not display, dismayed. There is no similar word in this interpretation according to it, its context is like um, tehatu, um, tehat be not dismayed for making my name known among the heathens or the nations. Let you hear from Mount Sinai, and I told you there that there is no God besides me. You And you are my witnesses that I opened for you seven heavens and showed no God besides me. Okay, you are my witnesses. And there is there is no rock I did not know. Jonathan renders, and there is no strong one unless he has given strength to me. And I did not know, Gedati is in Hebrew, an expression similar to Exodus 33, verse 17, and I knew you by name. And um, Deuteronomy, Ve'adatcha, and he knew, and um, from Yada to know, and you're going, okay, and I knew you in the desert. Okay, so major conclusion that Rashi makes here in his commentary is that the Lord God is the only true and eternal God who has revealed himself to Israel and chosen them as his witnesses. He also explains the meaning of some difficult words and phrases in the verse and compares them with the Targum Jonathan, the Aramaic translation, and the paraphrase of the Hebrew Bible. Now, in Part one, Rashi, because it's, it's parts one through five here, you see that in part one, Rashi explains the word um, tirhu, which is, uh, which is this word right here. And uh, be not dismayed has no similar word in the Hebrew language, and its interpretation depends on the context. And um, he suggests that it, may, that it means, be not dismayed for making my name known among the heathens or the nations. And in the same word, uh, tahatu, be not dismayed, in Deuteronomy 121, and uh, Rashi goes on to discuss the phrase, uh, I, did I not let you hear from then, which he says, which he refers to Mount Sinai, where the Lord spoke of... Uh, where the Lord God spoke to Israel and told them that there is no God besides him. Now, in part three of the commentary, he adds the word va'atem edei. Okay. Um, and we're looking here at, at right here. Okay. And um, that's what Rashi is looking at. And it says, there, and you are my witnesses. And means that God opened for them seven heavens and showed them that there is no other God and that they are his witnesses to this fact. You know, so the concept here is that God's revelation is multidimensional, right? Seven heavens, right? Which was necessary for pro proving that there are no other gods and that his revelation has many layers of application to our lives. In part four, Rashi compares the rock, right? He says, he says, Ve'en sur uh, bal yadati, right? And, and so um, he says that there is no rock besides me, right? With, with in the Targum Jonathan, um, which renders that there is no strong one unless he is given strength by me. So he Rashi explains that the rock tour means God, and that the the word um, bel, uh, bliadi means um, besides me means from beneath before me, as in the words for um, that we we saw here in the in the um, the Aramaic targum uh, right here. Okay, and. So, uh, let's see, meaning that, you know, I did, I did not acknowledge as an expression, I knew you by name, or he, he knew you're going, or I knew you in the desert, you know, and so forth. And so Rashi uses these various references because they work together to help us understand the Isaiah text better in its application for our lives by showing us how God's knowledge of his people is not merely intellectual, but relational and personal. You know, the Lord God knows us by name, 
by our actions and by our circumstances. We notice how this implies that our actions are an important part of our faith in relationship with the Lord God of Israel. The Lord God knows us intimately and cares for us deeply. He also expects us to know him and obey him as he is the only true and eternal God. This, this is very significant in, in relation to who we are as God's people. And um, these things should inspire us to cultivate a closer relationship with God and his Messiah, to trust in his love and guidance, and to acknowledge his sovereignty and his uniqueness. You know, these scriptures also challenge us to be faithful witnesses of God to the world and to avoid idolatry and falsehood. So these scriptures also comfort us in times of trouble, knowing that the true God knows us and is with us. Right Now, uh, let's go on and let's look at the next set of verses from the Targum. So verse 9 through 11, and it says that they make images, all are of them vanity and worship does, and worship what does not profit them, and they are witnesses against themselves that they do not see nor know that they may be ashamed. Whoever maketh a god or a molten image, it is for no purpose. Behold, all their worshippers shall be ashamed in the working artificers for our workmen and the sons of men, let them all be gathered together. Let them stand up. They shall fear and be confounded together. Okay, so here, um, here the uh, the target uses the word talmaya right here. Okay, instead of the word pesel. Okay, and this um, talmaya means images. And Pesel means graven images, okay, to describe the idols that the people make in worship. And this may be to emphasize how the idols are the creation of man um, from the imagery that he has in his own mind, right? And this, this word also implies the futility and the vanity of worshiping something that is merely a representation of God. And remember that God commands us to, that we are not to make idols or images of him according to the Torah, you know, like what we see right here in Exodus uh, Sefer Shemot, Pasuk, uh, or Perak uh, Kaf, you know, chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, where um, it says, V'deber Elohim et kol ha'devarim ha'el el amor. You know, so the Lord God said all of these things, saying, Anochi Adonai Elohecha asher hotze ticha me'eretz mitzrayim mi'bayit Avadim, you know, that I am the Lord your God brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and lo yihye lecha Elohim acharim al planai, you know, so that there you shall have other gods before me, right? And um, it goes on, it says, lo tase lecha pesel vekol tamuna asher beshamayim mima'al vesher be'aretz mitachat Vesher b'mayim mitachat la'aretz. Okay, so um, you shall not make unto you any graven image or likeness of anything that is in heaven or above or there's earth beneath or there's the water underneath the sun. And then um, and it goes, lo um, tishtachave lehem, you're not to bow down to them. Lo um, ta'avadem, you're not to serve them. Ki anochi adonai l'cheha, because I am the Lord your God. Al kana poked avon avot al banot al shilashim the al rebeim lisan lisanai. Okay, so you don't have to bow down to them, worship them, or serve them. For I am the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God, right? He is a jealous God, and um, visiting iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations that hate. Him, they hate me. Okay, and you note that these iniquity of the fathers is visited onto those who hate God. Okay, so God says directly to not make here in these scriptures to not make any uh, image or likeness of an um of anything or of uh, any other gods, and it's that's uh, Elohim Acharim, like other gods, right? You're not to make any gravy, any pestle, right? No, no, um, let's see here. You're not to make uh, for yourselves a pestle, right? Anything that, any kind of idol, right? And 
to this, which describes the the idols that the people make and worship. You know, the Targum adds the Targum translation adds this phrase the in worship what does not profit them. Okay, to explain why the idol makers are um, are nothing and their idols are worthless. Let's look. Let's look at that. Uh, let's see here. Um, so we're looking at. And it says, and worship those that do not profit them. Okay, and that is this right here. Okay, and um, right there. And then uh, I'll change and do this one here. Okay, and so that that's added. And to explain why the idol makers are nothing and idols are worthless, right? And th this emphasizes the contrast between the true God who benefits his people and the false gods who cannot help them at all. Now, the word, uh, this word here, benafshatehun, oops, a different link, ink, benafshatehun, um, this, this word, it means against themselves, you know, specifies that the idol worships worshipers are their own witnesses of their own ignorance and shame okay so this implies that they have no excuse for their idolatry and they will be held accountable for their actions so the gifts this again ties back to what rashi's interpretation that we looked at that god knows our actions and this is also how the torah interprets our relationship with god that our actions speak to the truth that is in our hearts right you know what we truly believe you know the targum uses this word um this word uh right here um this word right here okay and i'll circle it in both locations okay it, it uses this word to mean their worshipers to include the worshipers that's in the group that will be ashamed and confounded you know it's not just the maker right and so this may be to show that both the producers and the consumers of idols are guilty and liable for their sin so these differences in a translation affect may it may affect our interpretation and application of the scriptures by the targum uh reminding us that god is the only true and living god that he alone deserves our worship and devotion therefore we should avoid any form of idolatry whether it is worshiping images objects people or anything else that is not of god sports right you know the the targum warns us that idolatry is not only a waste of time and resources but also a source of shame and dishonor you know the hebrew bible says the same you know seeking the god of israel and his messiah makes the use of our time beneficial idolatry makes the use of our time unbeneficial right and seeking um you know idols is uh seeking these false gods that can neither help nor harm right they're, they're worthless and they actually cause one to uh go and be bound up in their sins right and be blind and not be set free from the truth that is in god in the father and in the son right in 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 yeshua the messiah so the targum teaches us again that idolatry is self-deception and self-condemnation condemnation right and this implies that we are to be humble and honest before god the god of israel and acknowledge our need for him and not to be proud and foolish and think that we can make or find something better than him right you know the lord god is the one who satisfies now when we look at these verses and see if there's any parallels in the new testament um there are some things that may be alluded to by Yeshua and his and his Talmudim, his disciples. You know, for example, in Acts 17, verse 29, Paul argues that God is not like wood, silver, or stone that's shaped by human hands in the imagination. So he's stating that these things, um, he states these things and echoes the words of Isaiah that we see here in the text, right? And Paul describes according to Romans uh, Romans 1 verse 21 to 23 how the Gentiles exchange the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men birds animals reptiles and um, again this reflects the words of Isaiah according to Isaiah 44 verses 9 through 11 now in 1st Corinthians 8 4 um, Paul affirms that there is no God but one and that an idol is nothing in this world but the worship of demons, you know, reflecting the words of Isaiah 44 verses 6 through 8. Um, Paul affirms that there is no God but one and that an idol is nothing in this world. And um, Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 10 
that the things the Gentiles sacrifice to are demons and not to God. Again, you know, we see this in multiple places. And in Revelation 9.20, it reports how that the rest of mankind who were not killed by the plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. And uh, so, and they continued to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and of brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk or recall words, you know, etc. So what, what these things imply is that uh, what's happening is meant to be a, a wake-up call, but due to the hardness of one's heart, one does not recognize the call of God to walk in Teshuva and to seek his holy and righteous ways and believe in the Messiah Yeshua. So again, you know, idolatry has a great danger in our in life that if we are unrepentant of the idolatry and we don't seek freedom by God and his Messiah Yeshua, that it can it can lead to, you know, uh, just not even being aware of the idols and in dying in our sins, right? And um and so forth. Okay, so next I want to look at Midrash Raba Bereshit 24 part 7, how it interprets this verse here. And it's, it's not too long here. It says the following. It says Rabbi Tanhuma in the name of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Menachem in the name of Rav said Adam the first man learned all the crafts in the world. What is the source? In Isaiah 44, 11, in craftsmen, they are me'adam, okay, from from Adam, right? Me'adam. Um, from Adam, the first man. He learned even how to score a parchment, as it is stated, this is the book, it and it's scoring. And this is the book of the descendants of Adam on the day that God created man. Okay, so this supports what Rabbi Eliezer ben Azariah said, Three miracles occurred on that day. One, uh, on that day, they, Adam and Eve, were created. And on that day, they cohabited. And on that day, they produced offspring. Ben Azaiah said, this is the book of the descendants of Adam. This verse represents the central tenet of the Torah. Rabbi Akiva said, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that this verse represents the central tenet of the Torah. As it teaches, you should not say, since I have been disparaged by someone, let me disparage along let me let someone else be disparaged along with me since i was cursed let someone else be cursed along with me rabbi tanhuma said if you do act like that how know who it is that you are disparaging in the likeness of god he made him okay so um we note that rabbi akiva agreed with yeshua on the significance of leviticus chapter 19 verse 18 and so um you know loving your neighbor right and uh, we note here in the Midrash that the rabbis are commenting on the verse in Genesis 5.1 that this is the book of the generations of Adam, you know, which introduces the genealogy of Adam and his descendants up on, on up until Noah. And it connects this to Isaiah 44 verses 9 through 11. So the major conclusions of the Midrash are that Adam was the first human and the source of all crafts and skills as implied by the wordplay between craftsmen and Adam, right, and from Adam in Isaiah 44, verse 11. And this verse is part of a passage that mocks the idol, idol makers who are contrasted with the true God, the creator of all things. Adam and Eve experienced three miracles on the day of creation. They were created, they cohabited, and produced offspring. And uh, so this is based on the phrase, on the day that God created man, in the Midrash. And it implies that all these events happened on the same day. And this shows that the power and the blessing of God who gave them life companionship and fruitfulness. We note that the Torah narrative together lays, you know, those are the three things, life, companionship, and fruit and fruitfulness. Okay, so the Torah narrative um, lays out a timeline, right? And when we actually read the scriptures, and that has the fall of man into disobedience before the companionship and fruitfulness parts of God's blessing on Adam and Eve, you know. Um, so the verse this is the book of the generations of Adam represents the central tenet of the Torah, according to Ben Azai in the Midrash. Uh, he teaches this because uh, it teaches the dignity and value of every human being who are all descendants of Adam made in the image of God. And then Rabbi Akiva, then at the end here, he agrees that by citing that Leviticus 19.18 says, love your neighbor as yourself as a central tenet 
of the Torah because it teaches the ethical and the moral implications of being created in God's image. So um, Rabbi Tanhuma warns against harming or insulting others because that would be disrespecting God's image in them at the end here, citing Genesis 5 verse 1. So these various parts of Scripture are drawn together to support the derivation of the meaning of the text from the literal and the figurative sense of the words, such as the word play between craftsmen and from Adam, you know, Adam, in Isaiah 44, verse 11, or the meaning of book and scoring, like what we read in Genesis 5, verse 1. You know, the rabbis compare or contrast the different verses or passages for the purpose of understanding the contrast between the idol makers and the true God, okay? And parallel this to the craft, the, the, the comparison between um, Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And so we note how they deduce from the text that Adam and Eve cohabited and produced offspring on the same day of their creation and compare this to the application that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. Okay, so these connections help us to understand the importance of the Torah in our lives in regards to the immediacy of obeying a command of God. There should be no delay, right? And the Torah reveals the nature and the character of God, who is the creator and the sustainer and the redeemer of all things, and who is worthy of our worship and obedience. So the Torah teaches us the value and the purpose of human life, which is to reflect God's image and glory and to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth and subdue it. And the Torah instructs us to live in harmony and love with God and with our fellow human beings who are all our neighbors and relatives and to avoid any harm or hatred that would mar God's image in us and in them. You know, all of these concepts are important and are related to the, the concepts that are presented here in Isaiah 44 verses 9 through 11. Now, let's look at the last part of uh, the last few verses from the Targum here. And here it says, um, here it says that the smith makes an axe out of iron and blows the coals in the fire and makes it with, makes it firm with the hammer and works it, works it with the power of his strength. But when he hath worked it, is hungry and does not eat bread. He has no strength and he is thirsty. Drink no water and he faints. And that is, that's verse 12. And then, it goes on, it says, the carpenter stretches out the line, he applies the plummet to it, he carves it with a knife, and he dovetails it together, and he makes it after the likeness of a man, according to the beauty of a woman, that it may remain in the house. That's verse 13. And then, uh, he heweth for himself cedars, and takes the scarlet oak and chestnut and seasons it. Okay, and then that's 14. Okay, so, um, the Targum paraphrases in adding in verse 12, that if he is weary from his work and cannot, he will have no strength in him. Okay, so um, we got, uh, let's see where that is. It's right, right here. Um, yeah, okay, so it goes all the way to here. Okay, and um, let, me, let me find the other verse over here. So this is what's, an addition to the in the translation and it means if he is weary from his work and cannot he will have no strength in him and this is not in the Hebrew Bible okay and we the phrase emphasizes the contrast between the human weakness of the idol maker and the divine power of the true God in verse 13 we see the word um, Nagara okay verse 13 it is um, Nagara. Let's see, where is that at? Okay, so it's the it's the first word over here, and it's just Nagar here in verse 13. That's why I couldn't find it. And um, also the word Harash, right, in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and it's using this word instead of, you know, Nagar instead of Harash. Okay, so um, Nagara means carpenter. And harash means craftsman, you know, and so this is maybe a more specific and descriptive type of work involving in making a wooden idol, right? And the Targum adds the word um, be'izmalaya, 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 right here. Um, let me change the ink right there. And right here, it means... Um, uh, with a knife, okay, 
to explain how the carpenter carves the idol, which is not in the Hebrew text. Okay, and in verse 14, the Targum changes the order of the trees, and it uses the Hebrew uh, mentioned as compared to mention the Hebrew text. It replaces the word um, Tirza, Cyprus, with Belut oak. Okay, um, right here. Okay. And then um, this may be differences in the species of the tree or a variant reading of the Hebrew Bible. And um, let's see, there is a, uh, yeah, right here. I was trying to see where it was there. And then um, tears, uh, let's see, I'll highlight that one there too so we can compare. Okay, so um, the Targum adds the word uh, netzav a plant to store up to describe how the idol maker obtains the fir tree, which is not in the Hebrew Bible. So these these differences may affect our interpretation and application of uh, of the text to suggest that um, we are to recognize the futility and foolishness of the idolatry and to contrast with it with the sovereignty and majesty of the true God who created and sustains all things. You know, we may also reflect. We can also reflect on how. We may be tempted to trust in human things or ideas rather than in the living God who, uh, and how we may repent and turn to him for salvation and guidance. We notice how this is what Judah and Jerusalem have been doing and is a theme that Isaiah has been prophesying about throughout his book to call the people back to faith in God alone. You know, so these verses aren't directly quoted in the New Testament, but again, there are some parallels that we may find in New Testament texts, like in Romans 1. Again, Paul describes how Gentiles exchange the glory of the more immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things and how they worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. You know, the passage echoes Isaiah 44 here, 9 through 20, which exposes the absurdity and the wickedness of idolatry. In 1 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul again reminds us of men, Gentiles who are carried away to mute idols which implies that the contrast between idols which have no voice or power and the true God, you know, who speaks and acts and through his spirit in, in blessing us, right, and living in through us. In 1 John 5, verse 21, John concludes his epistle with the exhortation, little children keep yourselves from idols. Okay, so the passage implies the danger and deception of idolatry and the need to remain faithful to the true God, who is a source and and uh, of eternal life and love. And so we also note how this also speaks to the eternal truth that is taught in the Torah regarding adultery, how God's people remain bound to the Torah by faith in Yeshua the Messiah. Now, I want to look at this commentary, Shnei Luchot Habrit, on uh, these verses and what it has to say. And this is a, one of the last things that we'll be looking at here. Um, so it says that, we had raised the question in the introduction to Parashat Bereshit why the Talmud in Haggai, um, Hagiga did not quote the commandment of Uruvu, or Peru Uruvu, okay, that means to be fruitful and multiply, in Genesis, when it wanted to tell us about the severity of neglecting to fulfill the commandment for procreation, and chose a line from Isaiah about God not having created the universe in order for it to remain um, tohu, which is void without form in an elementary state. We can now understand this when we consider that the passage of Talmud wanted to convey was that someone who fails to heed that commandment is as if he arrested the whole process of creation in its purpose by allowing the universe to remain static in a state of tohu, its very beginning, you know, formless and void and without form. Okay, so the rabbinic commentary here is from the work of Shanae Luchot Habrit, and this is a 17th century Kabbalistic commentary by Rabbi Isaiah Horowitz. The major conclusions of the Midrash are that the Chayl, or the primordial um, matter, is the same as the Tohu, or the chaos that is mentioned in the beginning of the creation. And this is the secret of the first thought of God, which is the source of all existence, according to the rabbi. And so the the commentary points out that God did not create the world to remain in a state of chaos, a tohu, but to be inhabited and populated by his creatures. So God is creating order, right? And this is the meaning of verse of Isaiah 45, verse 18, which says, He did not create it a waste, 
but formed it for a habitation. You know, the commentary draws out the command of procreation in this way as a way to fulfill God's purpose in creation by bringing um, the potential for procreation into actuality. Okay, so um, then contrasting that with um, the tohu, you know, the transforming tohu into a uh, a universe, into a cosmos, right? And this is why the, the Talmud in Hegiga 2a cites this verse to emphasize the importance of this commandment. And that's what they're, they're saying right here, um, Hagiga 2a. And the rabbis draw from the contrast in the beginning God created in Genesis 1 verse 1 to in, interpret the significance of the commands of God in our lives because they see this phrase as implying, implying that God had a plan and a purpose for creation that he gave us the commands to help us realize that plan and purpose. And the commands of God are not arbitrary or oppressive, but they are expressions of his love and wisdom and are the tools to transform the tohu into cosmos. You know, again, it can be a parallel. What we may see as chaos in our lives, God's word brings it into order, right? And it settles our life and brings peace and 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 uh, even in the midst of trial, right? And so we can see many parallels here. And this is how the rabbis interpret these things, that when one violates a command or refuses to listen, he's putting a uh, a danger, he putting in danger the entire universe because he in, interprets the process of obedience in its completion or interrupts or interrupts the, this process. So he leaves the world in a state of tohu, the one who rejects God's word, which is unstable and chaotic. You know, and this is why we see so much mental illness today because so many people reject God's word. You get gen confusion in genders, you get confusion in, in sex, you get con confusion in, in life, you know, itself. And so um, this is what happens when one rejects God's word and doesn't live by his word, right? And, and just wants to uh, live by his own ways in his own, his own understanding, right? And so these things, uh, these things imply that the disobedient man denies himself the joy in the fulfillment of obeying God's commands. And there's a great joy in performing a mitzvot, right? A mitzvah right, a command, since we are made in the image of God, a likeness of God. Okay, so um, there are some rabbinic sources that support these things. And the, I found a couple, for example, in Midrash Rabbah on, on Bereshit, Genesis 1.1, the rabbis state that God created the world for the sake of Israel and the Torah, and that he consulted with the Torah before creating the world. Okay, so you're talking about the, he consulted with the word of God, right? The, the wisdom of God, the wisdom of Torah. Wisdom was with God in, in, the, in the beginning, right? And there's where you find the word of God, like in John chapter 1, verse 1, right? And um, the word was with God and the word was God, right? And um, again, you know, these things imply that God had a plan and a purpose for creation. The Torah is the blueprint and the guide for that plan and that purpose. Now, um, in Midrash Rabbah in Genesis 128, the rabbis say that God blessed Adam and Eve and commanded them to be fruitful and multiply, and that this was the first commandment that God gave to humanity. This implies that procreation is the primary and essential commandment, and that it is a way to fulfill God's blessing and will in creation. You note that when we read the creation account, that God um, blessed the all of the created beings, you know, the creatures, the birds, the animals, the land, and the sea, and so forth. And tell them to be peru uruvu, to be fruitful and multiply. He had to do that with man as well, to be um, peru uruvu, to be fruitful and multiply, because it is a gift of God to be able to procreate. This is why children are such a blessing and so precious to us, you know, as um, as uh, being a, a gift from God, right? And um, so, and then Midrash Rab on Genesis two four. Um, the rabbis say that God made two worlds, one upper and one lower, that he placed Adam in the lower world to connect him, connect it with the upper world. This implies that a human being has a spiritual link to uh, what is above. And this parallels the concept that man obeys the commands is partnering with the divine, right? Then we read that, we talked about that last week. And mankind has a responsibility to do this through his actions and obedience to God's commands. Okay, so there is a spiritual connection to obeying God's word, right? And it affects our relationship with God. And so, again, we note that the word Torah 
is more properly interpreted as instruction, right? And it is God's instruction or teaching for his people. The Torah reveals God's will, his character, and promises and guides us to, to in how to live a life, a righteous and holy life before the Lord and, and others. And the Torah also points to Yeshua, who fulfilled Torah, like what we read in Romans 10. And Yeshua is also the living word of God who came to reveal God's grace and truth and to save his people from their sins. Okay, so the Torah itself says that the one who obeys will experience well-being, happiness, and faith in God. And so the Torah teaches that God blesses those who obey his commands and that he is the source of all good things. You know, the, the scriptures also demonstrate that God is faithful and loving and that he has a plan and purpose for his people. You know, and the scriptures say that um, that the Torah help the word of God helps a believer to appreciate the gift of the Messiah, who is the expression of God's love and mercy, and who enabled us to have a personal relationship with God through his death and resurrection. And, we, and in a study, I list all of, the, all of the references for this at the end of the study, so check that out. Um, but by trusting Yeshua, uh, a believer can also experience well-being and happiness and faith in God, you know. And so uh, Yeshua sends the Spirit of God to empower us to obey Torah, to, to live our lives for the Lord, to overcome sin in this world, right, and produce the fruits of righteousness, joy, and peace. You know, in Galatians, Paul speaks about that, and in Philippians, he speaks about that as well. Yeshua also gives us his grace, and which enables the forgiveness of our sins, frees us from guilt and condemnation. Yeshua also gives us hope, and it assures us of eternal life and glory and a glorious future with the God of Israel, okay? So, because of all of these things, you know, the, the conclusion is, is that the Torah of God and faith in Yeshua are, are intimately connected and uh, they are complementary to one another. They are not contradictory or opposing. You know, so they, they both reveal God's character and will. They both lead us to well-being, happiness, and faith in him, in, in the Lord. And as Yeshua himself said, do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So he came, and according to Matthew 5, 17, he came to show us the way of God, how to walk in his footsteps, to walk in, in the path that God is walking on, right? And that's the path that is according to the scriptures, okay? And so these, these are the things I got out of the Isaiah study for this week. Um, we'll be moving on to the next seven verses next week. So thanks for listening, for those who listened to the whole thing. And I appreciate you. And uh, give me a thumbs up on the study, okay? Thanks for listening. Bye.